Now that we've talked about all the different rules for naming and all the different kind of steps in the process, we want to put it all together and look at naming as a whole and dealing with uh, describing different compounds. So we have this overall system for naming things um, where we can start with, is it ionic or covalent? We have our rules for ionic, and then we have our rules for covalent compounds, and we can overall follow those. And so whenever you're naming just something, previously it was name this ionic compound, name this covalent compound, we want to put it together and start by figuring out what it is and then following the individual rule sets. So let's get a bit more practice. What are the names of the following compounds? I got Na2SO4, P2O5, SNCl4, and HBr. I always want to start with, is it ionic or covalent, which really means we're looking for a metal cation or ammonium. If it's covalent, how many the first element, how many the second element. Uh, if it's ionic, what's the cation, what's the anion. Um, you can use a crossover method to figure out those names. So Na2SO4. Na is a metal. Sodium is a metal. So this is an ionic compound. Okay. So Na is the cation. And so one of the things you'll notice right away Looking at this, so we know Na is the cation, so we could call it sodium. So when we're going through the process of figuring out the name, that means the rest of this has to be the anion. We can see that it is more than one atom. We should start, that should be giving us some alarm bells. This is a polyatomic anion. Okay, And so we may not know it yet. But this is kind of the process we can go through to realize like, hey, I only have, this is an ionic compound. I only have one atom for my cation. So everything else needs to be an anion. I should look up my polyatomics. SO4 is called sulfate. So this compound is sodium sulfate. If we go to the next one, P2O5, p Phosphorus, not a metal. So this is not a metal, um, meaning that this has to be covalent. So the question is, how many do I have? Right. So I take the two Ps, um, two right there, and then I take the five and five. And then I convert those just into my prefixes. So the two becomes diphosphorus, and the five becomes penta for pentoxide. When I look at SNCl4, SN is a metal. Because that's a metal, that means it's a cation. If you look on the periodic table, SN is beneath C. It's in the main group over there. It's not in group 1A or 2A. Okay, It's over on the other side of the transition metals. It's in the column beneath carbon. It's number 50. And so it's down there. And so what that means is that it has a variable charge. So in the case of sodium, we knew sodium was in group 1A, we could just call it sodium. But with tin, SN, it's variable charge, and we need to figure out what Roman numeral we would put there. And we can figure it out based off the charge of the chloride. Chloride is in column 7A. It's a halogen, which means when it forms an anion, it goes to negative 1. We have four of those chlorides in this compound. And so in order to be neutral, I have negative one times four, right? So that means there's a total of four negative charges. The tin has to balance that out and be positive four. So this is tin four chloride. This process of coming up with Roman numerals can be tricky. Um, but one of the things that we can kind of see in this example is that in the case of, say, the covalent compounds up here, the diphosphorus pentoxide, the, the two on the phosphorus went directly to the prefix on the phosphorus. Two became diphosphorus. But you'll notice with the tin, the four is the chlorines, the four chlorides, but that's really reflective of the four that is on the tin. 
it's not always perfect. It's not because if you have, say, an anion, that's not a negative one charge. It's not necessarily going to be the exact number. But the, the Roman numeral that goes with the metal is based on the subscript or determined by the subscript that's on the anion, on the non-metal, in this case, the four on the chlorine. HBr, um, H is a non-metal. It's over in that first column, but uh, it is the exception over there. It's a non-metal. So this is one H and one Br. No prefixes required, hydrogen bromide. Um, so naming compounds is in you're working through the system. Um, the best way to go about this is going to be practice. Uh, the best way to get better about this is practicing and practicing and practicing some more. So there's on the homework, there's some. There's additional problems on Blackboard about naming. They're just uh, ac activities and exercises I've used in previous and other throughout my teaching. And so you can take a look at those with answers. Um, there's online resources you can use to get additional practice. Um, and it's really just going to be a matter of working through this. I would start with sapling. Uh, because that's going to be uh, part of your grade. So I definitely encourage you to take a look at that um, and the participations, these problems, taking these seriously. Um, but I encourage you, more and more practice is the best way to improve here. So, so far we've focused on just taking uh, formulas and coming up with names, but we also want to be able to go the other way. And so this is in some ways trickier, but in some ways, uh, hopefully a little bit easier because one of the purposes of systematic naming is that we want to focus in on uh, you know having explicit rules so ideally these names contain all the information that is required to produce the formula that's the whole point of how we've come up with systematic naming rules so we want the molecular formulas for dinitrogen tetrahydride barium sulfate copper two hydroxide, bromine fluoride. So when I'm starting this process, I'm always going to start, you know, the same idea of that when we go from formula to name of is it ionic or covalent, right? How do I interpret this systematic name? If it's covalent, how many of each of them? If it's ionic, what are the cation? What's the anion? Use crossover method, those ideas. And so we really can use these ideas, ionic or covalent, but we can also, of looking for metal cations, but we can also parse other information that's in the name. So dinitrogen tetrahydride. So nitrogen is a non-metal, um, and it's not the word ammonium doesn't show up. This is just nitrogen by itself. Um, that means this is covalent. The other thing I can see is that there are prefixes in this name, di and tetra right away that means this is covalent even if i don't know that nitrogen is a non-metal if the name has prefixes in it it has to be a covalent compound similarly we use those prefixes explicitly when we're interpreting a covalent compound so di nitrogen that would be two nitrogens tetrahydride that's four hydrogens we're interpreting out those prefixes. Di is two, tetra is four. So that means this is just N2O4. We maintain the same order with nitrogen being first and hydrogen being second. Barium sulfate. Again, we kind of have some clues that this, we can use metal cations or whatnot, but the other thing we can key in on right away is that I have this prefix A-T-E. A-T-E, as that ending prefix, means this has to be an ionic compound and this is a polyatomic ion, okay? When we have monoatomic ions, right, sulfide, chloride, those end in I-D-E. When we have covalent compounds, they always end in I-D-E. If I have A-T-E, it has to be ionic. Barium is a metal, so this is an ionic compound, but I can already kind of key in on looking for those clues. When I see A-T-E, it's ionic. I want to be looking up barium, figuring out what its charge is. 
Um, I'm not given any information. There's no Roman numerals after barium here. So that means I have to use the periodic table to figure out the charge on barium. It's in column 2A, so it's Ba2+. Plus. Sulfate just is SO4 2 minus. Um, that is the definition of sulfate. We can use the crossover method. We can simplify. We get BaSO4. If we want to look at copper 2 hydroxide, um, there's a couple things we can key in on. Roman numerals, right away, this is ionic. If there's a Roman numeral in the name, this has to be ionic. Copper is the metal. It may be one you're familiar with. Or you're probably familiar. You've used copper, seen copper. Um, so that's good. But whenever you see a Roman numeral, right away, that's going to be an ionic compound. And you know that the charge on the copper is 2+. plus, right? You're not, You can't use the periodic table. You're just being told. In the case of barium, you had to figure out the charge based on the periodic table. But this, you don't need to. It's copper 2+. plus. It's given to you right there. When we now look at hydroxide over here, it is ending in IDE, which means it's the anion. And so one of the ways hydroxide is a polyatomic, one of the ways you could figure that out through brute force at least, is that hydrox is not the root of any element on the periodic table. There's no like hydroxine or hydroxer, hydroxygen, uh, anything like that. It is hydroxide, um, so there is no corresponding root um, that would correspond to an element. This is a polyatomic. Um, it is oxygen and hydrogen together in a polyatomic ion. Um, so you can look that up. It's OH minus. But again, you have to know that it's something you can look up. And so hydroxide is going to be one. It's not. It doesn't have an ATE that kind of flashes it out. Um, but uh, hydroxide is a very common polyatomic that we'll see. So copper two means you have the two plus charge, very nice. And then hydroxide, it has a negative one charge. So we can do the crossover method. We do need parentheses in this case because we have two around the polyatomic, uh, two of the polyatomics, but throw those parentheses on there, CuOH2. Finally, bromine fluoride. So bromine fluoride here. When we're looking at this one, there are no tricks or things to look at. There's no prefix, there's no ATE, there's no Roman numeral, but we have, so we have to just go through the brute force. Bromine, not a metal, so it has to be, it's not a cation. Bromine's an ana, a bromine's a non-metal, fluorine's a non-metal, so this has to be covalent. No prefixes means there's one of each, so one bromine, one fluorine. Formula is just BRF. We didn't use monos because bromine would never have a mono and fluorine isn't uh, oxygen, so it doesn't need a mono as well. It's been a lot. That brings us to the end of chapter two. Um, we want to know, you know, starts with talking about what atoms are into defining properties of atoms, the ions that they form, and then into some of the comp working through the periodic table, um, and then uh, the compounds that we form. So there's a lot here. Um, I encourage you. We still got a sapling homework to take a look at uh, to review that. There's some additional review materials uh, in the module too, if you want to take a look at those. If you want to watch some other videos that are a bit more professional uh, in terms of describing chemistry, fancier cartoons, as well as some simulations. Uh, uh, that you can work through and some practice problems, especially focused on naming. Um, if you have any questions about this, let me know.